Hey everybody, this is Andy from Tennis Euphoria and today a bit of a different video. It's sort of started with the racket of choice for me, which I get isn't that popular amongst some people. So it's kind of morphed into a comparison of the shortlist, um, 1820s for me, and also a quick run through of the process that I found in retrospect that I'd used to arrive at the racket that was right for me. Who knows, maybe that is a process that could help you guys uh, save some time and money and really help to identify that right euphoric tennis racket for you. So first thing to say is that I totally subscribe to the view that different rackets suit different people and sometimes that's not necessarily quantifiable. There's a certain X factor isn't there around playing with the right racket for you. However, what I have found from playing with now loads of rackets is that if you consider what that X factor is when you pick up different rackets and really take note of what their characteristics are, very often I think there's common themes and there'll be similarities in some of the specs. So with some trial and error, test, 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 you can arrive at a shortlist that will probably be close to what you're looking at. And from reviewing rackets, that's kind of what I had done. And what I've come to realize is that had taken three stages, which I think is helpful to pass on. So the first stage is to get it right in your mind as to what's right for your racket rise around the characteristics that you can't change. So that is head size, string pattern, and also thickness of beam. So what I'd encourage you to do is demo loads of rackets and establish what is best in all three of those categories and then get a sort of sub shortlist of rackets that match that. For me, I'd found that I was playing best and having the best X Factor moments with rackets that were 98 square inches or below, 1820 string patterns, and then also with thinner end beams. That, that was a sort of common pattern. So these were the rackets that I had ended up sort of holding on to, enjoyed playing with, and was considering, I guess, kind of investing in more, all of which were 98 square inches or below, 1820 string patterns, and most were pretty thin beamed. So the next stage was to play with them a fair bit and then sort of chip that down a little bit more. And the next area that I was looking at were sort of variables that I could change. So I was looking at weight, balance point, and swing weight mainly. And then from there, my third consideration, I guess, was more practical and economic. So what was the price point like on those rackets? And also, were they rackets that were easily customizable? Or in a perfect world, did they not need customizing at all? Could I just buy them off the shelf and play with them? And within that, I suppose, quality control became important too. So with those three categories in mind, I'll give you my thoughts on each of them as I played with them. So starting with the Yonex V-Core 97 uh, HD, this is a good example, I think, of sometimes things are not quantifiable. I mean, on paper and on spec, I should really get on with this racket. And I do think it's a good racket, but um, I just can't gel with it. Don't really understand why. Um, I do find that I have to adjust to it each time I hit it. And I didn't like that feeling of having to do that. So it was a no for me. It might be because of the ridiculously low RA, possibly. since 6195. So it sort of did tick boxes in the top category I suppose in the second category it fell down a little bit for me uh, pertinent to my needs it's obviously a very heavy racket when we look at the specs and also it's really headlight so I was finding that it needed customization at the top of the racket and by the time I'd got it playing right in that regard it was really quite hefty and that combined with that 95 square inch head size was just really on the periphery for me I wasn't being able to play quite as a effectively as I liked. So sweet spot was a challenge. I also felt that with the customization, it was a little bit too heavy. So that actually really helped me in identifying sort of what weight and what balance point potentially is gonna be right for me. So then moving on to the Prince 93P, full review of this to follow in the next video. So subscribe if you wanna see that. But I actually really liked this and learned a lot from it because it is relatively heavy but the balance point was pretty good for me. Uh, swing weight was okay. And also the thin beam on this one taught me quite a lot in this process. I really enjoyed playing with it. Still felt it was quite maneuverable, relatively stable at net. So 
Uh, it made me realize that combination of a good static weight and a relatively thin beam was probably important in that second criteria. The challenge I had with it, I, it's very different for me indoors versus outdoors. It's great to play with indoors, perfect conditions. When I was outdoors with it and it was windy, it was a bit of a nightmare. The sweet spot wasn't big enough for me to play with effectively. Um, so, and also on defense, I struggled a little bit with it. So it taught me a lot and I loved playing with it, but not the one for me. This one I spent quite a lot of time with was the Blade V7 1820. Now that was an interesting one because I've reviewed the 1619 very favorably and that video is on the channel if you want to go and have a look at it. And the 1820 was really interesting because the 1619 has quite a tight pattern and I actually didn't feel there was a huge amount of difference switching between the 1619 and the 1820 when it came to launch angle control precision. I actually couldn't really pick between the two as to which one I preferred. So the 1820, you know, possibly there's a little bit more control there, so that's a good thing, but I felt launch angle was similar. And if there was a negative, I, I felt maybe because of that pattern, the sweet spot wasn't quite as good as the 1619. And I was having sort of random experiences with the uh, blade lovely feel now it does everything kind of pretty well it has got pretty good spin and power as well i guess the beam is delivering a bit of that uh, but for me i would just occasionally have off moments with it at times i would just not play too well with it i couldn't put my finger on it i'd spray shots a bit uh, so the sort of x factor elements weren't quite there for me i wasn't really feeling i could trust it so then a strong runner on paper gave it a great review, the Technofiber TF4305. Uh, this is a great racket. I mean, it has awesome feel. I described it as a potential modern classic, one that people will remember in my reviews, and I definitely still think that's the case. Uh, for me, I learned a bit from that as well. So the 1820 had a launch angle that was only just okay so I felt I'd have to get the stringing right and probably couldn't variate from the stringing which was something that I wanted to be able to do have uh, different tensions in my bag for different situations and I wasn't sure that I could get that right with the TF4305 I also found that maybe part of that was its balance point so the RS and the XTC305s are you know quite head heavy and as I've reviewed in them they're hard to swing I found that this was on the sort of periphery as well as to what was right for me balance point wise. Um, occasionally I'd hit into the net. I think maybe I'd tire with it. So learned a lesson from that racket as well. Balance point, really important. Maneuverability, not quite as good in this as some of the other options. So we're down to the last three and in third place was the Head Pro Tour 2.0. Now I love this racket, it did feel a bit familiar to what I played with as a junior and it's got a bit more pop compared to the Bumblebee I felt after I've played with it a little bit more so it felt a bit more I guess sort of appropriate for the modern game and I can't really knock it, I actually you know, really do like this racket, I just think on balance the 95 square inch head with the Pro Tour 2.0 just lost a little bit of forgiveness and sweet spot for me and so in my gut I think I know that whilst I'd really enjoy playing with this I possibly wouldn't play quite as effectively as I would with the other two so a really close run thing it was ticking all of my boxes it had lots of x-factor as well but I think deep down I just knew that maybe a 95 square inch head wasn't where I needed to go. Second place comes the Wilson Ultra Pro and I'm going to lump in the Ultra Tour as I view them very much as the same racket and I've got a couple of the Ultra Tours and one Ultra Pro. Um, I love this racket you have to customize it to get it right and I was finding that about sort of 12 grams of lead spread around 12 nine and three was the way to go with it. It gives you more plow, more stability. Um, it's quite whippy still if you get that distribution right. So three and nine should have the majority of the lead I found, but that does give you a little bit more plow, more stability that it really lacks in stock form. I suppose the downsides come in exactly that process for me. So I do believe the Ultra Tour and the Ultra Pro are exactly the same. I don't really notice any difference. 
but the Ultra Pro that I bought was off spec and that really worried me about quality control. It also made me realize that if I was gonna to commit to this racket, I would probably be buying rackets at great expense because ProLine now is seems to be separated by Wilson and it's more expensive and I'd be then customizing them. So I just felt there was more risk in them from a reliability perspective if I had a lot of them in my bag. So whilst I actually loved playing with this racket, beam thickness, great, with customization, it plays just how I want it to. I just felt that from an economic and a quality control perspective, um, it lost out to the head. So the winner for me is the Head Graphene 360 Plus Prestige MP. And I think this is a brilliant racket. It's the racket for me. And that's saying something because if um, any of you are UK based football fans, I'm really a blue over a red, not Manchester clubs. Um, so it pains me to play with a red racket, but I do think that this is absolutely fantastic for me and i'll tell you why first of all we have a prestige with a true 98 square inch head and i think that is big for this line of rackets it plays brilliantly from the baseline for me it's modernized in that respect you can really sort of sit in rallies with big hitting baseline players and be confident that it's got your back whether you're counter punching defending or even hitting out and just trying to slog it out with someone on the baseline so it's great in that regard it's an 1820 but it's not too dense so i get all of the control and precision that I want from this racket, but I also still get a pretty good launch angle and spin if I need it. Also, I think probably the best thing about it is you have a combination of a relatively heavy racket, but then you have a really nice thin beam and a good balance point, or at least a balance point that's perfect for me. So what does that deliver you? It gives you maneuverability, speed of racket through the air, but it also gives you a bit of stability on the racket too. So at net, it's very stable still. And also, of course, on serve, it's got a fair bit of mass that moves through the air quickly. So you can generate good serves with this racket too. And then if I think about what's delivering those X factor sort of feelings, then of course we have graphene, which I've never been a fan of, but I just think now that we have the spiral fibers, uh, it makes all the difference. And it has a sort of almost familiar feel to it. Sort of prestige old head, really nice feel. I love the grip. I just think that the spiral fibers combined with graphene, which ultimately is a really durable um, substance, which you do find in other sort of sporting goods like some hardcore trainers. I think that combination actually now works quite well, but the graphene desperately needed to be softened up and flexed up. And that's re represented in the RA. It just feels right for me. I think you get enough feedback. You do feel connected with, to the ball. And then to give that thin beam a little bit more kudos, I think that thin beam with the cap grommets makes all the difference. So swing weight is really manageable, but I think you do have enough mass, as I say, to have a thin beamed racket that's moving through the air really quickly with nice feel, but still remains stable and is not gonna be pushed around enough, particularly again on defense when you need it. So there you have it, that's the racket for me. I certainly play much better with this racket than I do with others and it will be very difficult, I think, for another racket to come along and knock it out of my hand. Um, my expectation is that we will see spiral fibers moving around the racket more. That seems to be what racket manufacturers do. I can only think that that's gonna improve this line of rackets. So I think I'm definitely a candidate for upgrading to the next version of this racket. If we have more spiral fibers around the racket, that could be quite interesting. I do think the head uh, Graphene 360 Plus Radical Pro will be interesting. Now that's a 1619, but if it's anything like the predecessor, then you'll have a good launch angle there. Not suggesting for one minute that I'll switch to it, but I think that will be similar to this racket in as much as it will have similar characteristics, particularly if you add perhaps cap grommets to that when it comes out, and I'm dying to play with that for a play test. Hope that was helpful. Um, it's really nice feeling to know what racket you're gonna go to if you've got a match. I'll certainly come back to this racket all of the time. I'll continue reviewing, however, and I hope that that process of looking at the things that you can't change in a racket first, then considering the other variables that you perhaps could tinker with, 
and then looking at those other uh, economy price point and quality control and the third element is helpful as a sort of process or system for you to look at when you're testing and trying to find the racket that's right for you thanks for your time really appreciate you watching and if you haven't already please subscribe to the channel as that would really help me out see you soon